So uh, welcome to Cat Chat with Dr. Rachel Geller. Rachel is also known as the Cat Doctor and is a certified cat behavior specialist and she got her certification from the Humane Society of the United States. Rachel has also developed and championed a program called Cat Behavior and Retention, which is also sponsored uh, by the Humane Society of the United States. This program that Rachel has developed uh, last year alone saved probably or approximately 300 cats. The idea is for people to be able to learn how to work with the cats that they have without returning them to a shelter or to wherever they got them from or to be able or to let them out into uh, the outdoors. So Rachel successfully has counseled uh, the owners of over 300 cats last year and she continues to be on track to do that many this year. So Rachel, do you wanna tell us a little bit about what's going on in your life and your world in the cat world right now? Well, right now I am on the board of directors of the Cat Connection in Waltham and I'm also affiliated with Bay Path Humane Society on their Education Outreach Committee. And in addition, I am the cat behaviorist for Here Today, Adopted Tomorrow, which is a cat sanctuary. So I'm very busy doing all kinds of cat-related work and buzzing around helping cats and people. And so many people do always ask me, why do you spend your time helping cats? Why don't you help people instead? Maybe that would be a better use of your time. And I always explain to people that whenever you help a cat, you're always helping a person as well. So I find it very re rewarding. I love working with cats and with people. And um, I think my mission in life is to save cats. And you do a lot of this. Uh, obviously, you're very active in the cat community in the shelter world, been on many TV shows, many radio talk shows. Um, but tonight we were thinking about doing this a little bit differently, making it more of a question and answer format. So the idea is for the audience that we're with tonight to come up and ask a question and to give you the opportunity to have some interaction with that person and be able to answer questions. Then are usually a lot of your questions are pretty typical that you hear over and over again. So. With that, we're going to start with Susan, who is from Reading. Wakefield. Oh, Wakefield. I screwed that <laughs> one up. So local area. Okay. But Susan, if you want to just step right up. and sure. Sure. Um, Rachel, I have a question. My son's cat, Gus, he seemed to be scratching his couch all the time instead of the scratching post. So I was just wondering, any solutions for that? OK, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. That's a great question. I get that all the time. People will say to me, how can I get my cat to stop scratching? And the first thing I always explain to people is, we want our cats to scratch. Scratching sloughs off the dead sheaths of their claws. It's an emotional release for the cat. It stretches their muscles. They feel really great when they have that release and they're stretching their back muscles. It releases tension. So we want our cats to scratch just not on our couches and on our furniture. So the first thing we want to do is deter from the place that the cat is scratching while at the same time provide an attractive place for the cat to scratch. So many times people deter, but they don't redirect. And one very important thing to do with cats is you always want to set the stage so your cat thinks it's all his idea. Cats like to make the choices and they like to have a lot of say in the process. So the best thing to do for deterring the cat is to think slick or sticky. So put something on the couch, maybe double-sided tape, um, a carpet runner with a nubby side up, something plasticky, something slippery. Cats don't like that feeling and that texture. So they're not going to go and use that. Now at the same time, if you're going to deter, now you need to provide something else very appealing. Think about the scratching post your son has that's not being used and make sure it has these qualities. It should be at least three feet tall because if it's too short, they're not gonna get the appropriate stretch. It should be sisal wrapped or rope wrapped 
because that's the right texture to um, get the dead sheaths off the claws. And you don't want the scratching post to wobble. It needs to be really sturdy. Because if it wobbles, the cat's going to be afraid of it. And the cat may then not use the scratching post again if it's associated with fear. Last, think about maybe the cat would prefer um, some horizontal scratching. So think about the scratching post that you have. So now get a great new appealing post that fits all of these qualifications and put it near the couch. So the next time the cat comes up to the couch and he goes to scratch it, he's going to see the surface that used to be appealing now be very unappealing. And then he'll look and see this great new scratching post right there. <gasps> How lucky can a cat get? And once he sinks his claws into that post, he will realize how much better that is than the alternative, and then you're on your way to having a cat using the scratching post. So does, does that answer your question? Yes, Do you have any follow-up questions? No, <laughs> good, good job. Um, so our next question is from Mark. And step right up and speak right into the mic. Good evening. My question is very simple. When I play with my cats, I use a wand, if you want to call it. I don't know exactly what you call it. It's like a stiff yo-yo. When I have the cat follow it, at what point do I let the cat catch it? That's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, a lot of times when people are playing with their cat, they think that the whole point of the game is how long they can keep the toy away from the cat. How long can they make the cat chase the toy? But really, with interactive play, what you want is to provide as many captures as possible during the game. It's the capture that releases the tension and anxiety the cat might have. It's the capture that makes the cat feel like a successful hunter. He's, you know, king of his castle, master of the jungle. He's able to catch his prey. It's the capture that provides all the good feelings and bonding for the cat. So you want to make sure during a session you give the cat plenty of time to actually get the toy. And this is why I personally hate laser pointers. I know people think they're fun and it makes the cat go crazy, but the cat never gets the capture. The cat never gets to sink his teeth or his claws into something. And it actually builds more frustration and tension, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do. Most people play with their cat so they'll have fun and release some anxiety and get that opportunity to catch prey. And cats don't get any of those when they're using the laser pointer. So to answer your question, um, play with the cat. Let the cat catch the mouse or whatever's at the end of your fishing pole type toy. And when the cat notices that the prey has stopped moving, he'll eventually loosen his grip a little or, or loosen his bite a little bit, and then you can resume the game. So do that a few times, let the cat have a lot of captures, and when you're done playing, don't just, oh, look at the time, we're done, and walk away. Kind of wind down the game. Think of what might really happen with prey. Maybe the prey gets tired, the prey gets injured, maybe the prey died. Kind of wind down the game, get slower and slower and slower, and let that cat have one last really great final capture. And if you want to finish it off with a little treat, you'll simulate kind of the feast after the hunt, and that's an even better way to end the game. Good. Follow-up question? Did you get all that? I have notes. You have notes. Good job. <laughs> All right, our next question is from Kendra. Yeah, actually, I have kind of a follow-up question as to you know, playing with the toy like he, he was just talking about. Um, sometimes when, when the cats are, you know, they may be seem kind of bored with, with what you're doing. And, and I found uh, if, we, if we kind of pull the toy or do it around the corner, have you, I mean, is, is that part of adding, building the suspense for the cat? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, or is that just my cat? Well, I mean, it's the, that really, it's more interesting if suddenly it disappears around yes, the corner. Yes, because any time that you can mimic how prey would really act, so many okay. times people will take the toy and dangle the toy in the cat's face. Well, 
Prey doesn't really do that. So your cat's not going to really have any type of excited anticipation with that type of a game. But if you think about prey and sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down, maybe you slither around the corner, you're high, you come out, that's more realistic to a cat. So yes, that's going to spark the cat's prey drive when you use the toy in a way that mimics prey. Okay, so, well, I, I've, I've noticed that, but I just thought maybe it was just my cat. Um, I have a question that actually refers more to my son's cat. And um, over the summertime, they were away for like a week or two. They've always been litter box trained. They have a cat box upstairs. They have a cat box downstairs. They have two cats. So that's all what we think you're supposed to be doing. However, when they came back, they discovered that the cat... Even though we had people there um, who were taking care of them, making sure that they were okay during the day and had water and everything, suddenly the cats were not using the litter box. There was there were pots on the rug. There were places on the sofa. I mean, they had to throw away some rugs. Um, how could they avoid that? I mean, what is there something they can do? There is. So cats love routine. A cat's ideal world would be if nothing ever changed day in and day out, things happen at the same time, all the time, and everything stood still. But obviously that's not going to happen. So what I would recommend when, if you are moving, and you know ahead of time that you're moving, when you get to the new home, set up what I would call a sanctuary room for your cats. Let them have one room that they stay in for anywhere from maybe three or four days to a week. Go at the cat's pace. You can, when the cats seem like they maybe want to get out of the room and they're greeting you when you walk into the room, that's a sign that they're ready to start exploring. But to go into a huge new house and be kind of plopped into this new environment is very overwhelming to a cat. Cats are very territorial. They like to know they have their own space. So it's always best to start off cats in a new home in one room. And don't feel like it's a prison sentence. Don't feel bad. They are going to have plenty of new things to explore and get used to and smell and investigate. So they're going to be busy enough in that one room for a while. It helps them get them their bearings. And go in and visit often. Like I said, it's not a prison sentence. So go into that room as much as you can. Spend time with the cats. Sit next to them, bring in your laptop, check your emails, talk on the phone, be, just be in there. And when the cats are using the litter box normally and have settled down, that's an indication that they're ready to start exploring the rest of the house. So set up what I call a sanctuary room, have their food and water on one side, have the litter box on the other side, be sure to have a scratching post in there. Solo toys are good, puzzle feeders are good. Go in there often. And when you walk in the room and they're starting to greet you, they're eating normally, they're using the bo litter box normally, then you know they're ready to start exploring. Now, if it's a very large house, I would even suggest sectioning off the house. So instead of then letting them go to the whole house, maybe use two baby gates and section off a piece of it and gradually move those gates so they investigate the house bigger and bigger um, in controlled portions, so to speak. So basically what happened was the cats were very overwhelmed. There were a lot of new sights, new smells, and they were just really stressed out. When they're in the one room by themselves and they have the litter box right there, that's the perfect way to, for them to get acclimated to their new surroundings and their new box. And then you can move out from there. Now, do you feel, though, that, that there can be something, even just with going on vacations, because actually you, you explained what did happen when they moved as well, but even on vacation, when they came back from vacation, they would, you know, it must be the routine that well, you're saying? Right. Cats, like I said, they, they don't like it when their people go away. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very cognizant of going away because I know my cats get a little bit of separation anxiety. Um, a lot of cats do have separation anxiety, and there are techniques that you can use to help ameliorate that. Um, to me, puzzle feeders are a great um, option when you're away on vacation because they keep the cat's mind and body active 
And when they're involved and focused on something other than their own fear and anxiety, that's very helpful. Um, the other thing you can do when you go away is think of creating signs of life in your home even though you're not there. So timers, maybe leave a TV or a radio on. Things that kind of make the house feel like people are still there are really helpful for cats who suffer from separation anxiety. Yeah, I can I, I can see how that might that might certainly help and yeah. maybe save the rugs yeah. and a few other things that they have. Well, thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you, Kendra. All right. So, who would like to ask the next question? Michael. Thank you for volunteering. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Geller. Um, You're welcome. I have a cat. He's an eight-year-old rescue, and he's come a long way. Um, and uh, but we every now and then he sort of creates his own anxiety. I don't know if it's coming from us, but uh, he was mowing the side of his fur. So it's like his whole left side, he just kept grooming and grooming and grooming. And uh, we tried to um, try different diets and uh, took him to the vet and we couldn't really get any answers. Um, I was just wondering what might be the cause of that kind of uh, condition. So over grooming is often um, caused <coughs> by tension and anxiety in the cat. Um, many times we don't even realize it, but if we're stressed out over something, or we're worried about something, or we're speaking in a different tone of voice because we have concerns, our cats do pick up on that. And often if I'm stressed, my cat will be stressed. So if you have you know, times when maybe you raised your voice or you have worries, cats absolutely pick up on those things. So the first thing you might want to do is think about what's going on in your home or the environment. Did something change that's stressing out the cat? Um, now before somebody asked about how to play with a cat, and so that is part of my answer to this question as well. Interactive play with a fishing pole type toy is probably mm -hmm. the best way to boost confidence in your cat. So one thing I suggest for people who have cats who are, tend to be prone to stress, over grooming, um, any type of compulsive behavior is interactive play therapy. And I say interactive play therapy because again, I want people to think about using a fishing pole, providing multiple captures for that cat. The capture just allows that cat to feel confident about him or herself. He's a hunter, he's king of the castle, you know, he can go out and get his prey. And it's very, very um, good confidence building technique. And if you interactively play with your cat twice a day, 15 minute sessions, you will absolutely see a huge difference in the confidence level of that cat. And then again, things like puzzle feeders. So the cat is focusing on something other than his own anxiety is really helpful too. Last, sometimes people will say to me, my cat doesn't really like to play. If you're using a fishing pole type toy with the cat, and even if the cat is just following the toy with his eyes, he's still focusing on something other than his own stress and tension, and so that's still a positive thing to be doing with your cat. So didn't you used to have a cat that was able to read your calendar? <laughs> Maybe you could tell everybody that story. I'm talking about how stress and how it's transferred to your pets. This is very true. So we had a cat named Tuffy, and we used to joke that Tuffy could read my calendar because Tuffy was a very friendly and engaging cat. But every three to four months, he would suddenly decide to hide under our bed, but not just like under our bed near the periphery, but in the middle under the bed, so there's no way you could get to this cat. And he only did this on the days that I had written in my calendar that he had a vet appointment. <laughs> now, clearly Tuffy was not reading my calendar, but Tuffy had a heart condition. He had cardiomyopathy. So I would become very stressed on the day of his vet appointment because I was always worried is he going to get a good report? Will his heart be okay? Am I going to stress him out, bringing him to the vet? <gasps> Will his heart be able to take that? And I would get all worked up about bringing my cat to the vet. So he sensed that I was very afraid of something, 
And he figured, well, if mom is afraid of something, I better be afraid of that too. And he would go and hide. And he consistently did this every time he had a vet appointment, whether it was two weeks apart, once a year, twice a year. He would go and hide under the bed on the day he was going to the vet. So yes, he was absolutely picking up on my sure. tension and fear and decided he better go hide because mom's afraid of something and I better make sure I'm safe too. Right. Yes. So they... Yes. Stress transference. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that... Yes, he, please ask a follow-up question. Yeah, well, because, <laughs> I mean, that helps me with my question because he stopped doing it all of a sudden. But now that I think about it, during that time, we were, we were going through a, the loss of a family member. And, uh, you know, we think something's wrong with him, but I guess he, he saw something was wrong with us. It's very true. And cats will pick up on, you know, um, loss, divorce, mm -hmm. stress. And think of anything that happens in your life that's extremely stressful. And your cat will pick up on that. And so it's really very, they're very in tune to us. And they will react to, how, to things that we are reacting to. So that totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Even, um, you know, a kid going off to college. I've, I've worked with people where cats have reacted to that. So they're really mirrors of us. I guess that's why they call them copycats. Exactly. Oh, I like one. that. Very like well that done. Yes. Thank you. Never thought yes. of that. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> another question? Susan, you want to ask another? You're entitled to ask, too. Oh, Debbie has a question. Debbie's coming And then up. Janice. All right. So while Debbie's coming up, should I talk about full disclosure that you're my wife? You can or bring that up. We, we want to keep that a secret. Well, I think that... Bruce? I think that <laughs> cat's, cat's out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We have to be very careful I about actually, cat jokes in I actually house. will just say, and this is an aside, and then we'll get to Debbie's question. I really highly dislike those idioms like... There's more than one way to skin a cat oh. or the cat's out of a bag. Right. I really dislike those, even ones that aren't cat related. Like, um, why do we say let, I'll kill two birds with one stone to mean I'm going to do a couple things at the same time? I just find they're all so violent and they're all against animals and it really bothers me. I just think as a society, <laughs> but I mean, I don't know how I'm going to get this accomplished, but we just shouldn't use violent language towards animals to to talk about everyday things that are in our life it's I, it's a <coughs> it's something I, I dislike but i think if we could all be more cognizant of our language and those phrases that really that's what they they are they're all like violent phrases of, about animals to talk about some occurrence in our lives so everybody think about that don't use those expressions anymore okay, okay. we don't use them in our house anymore <laughs> <coughs> we don't know where some of these things have come from. I don't but, know, but we yeah. need to end it. We need to eradicate these oh. things. Mm -hmm. Debbie. I actually had one, and now I've got two questions. <laughs> <laughs> My second question came from your last story about the kitty with the vet. I have a new kitty that came from an abuse situation that I've been working with, and she's not 100% with us yet, like general population. Taking her to the vet right now is scaring me because I'm not able to pick her up, but... I don't want to scruff her, make it bad. She has a carrier open in her room, and I always keep one open in my house. My boys will sleep in it. So that was my first question. And then my second is a foster kitty that he's four years old, has been through a lot, was declawed at some point, and is now doing the horrible bunny kick with the back claws, and he's drawing blood, and literally, he's with another woman as foster. When she's leaving the room, he literally will jump on her leg and back bunny kick with his back claws and we want to figure out how to get him to stop. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with your first, your le second question first. Okay, so first of all, um, declawed cats do tend to bite more and to attack more and to bunny kick more because they feel vulnerable. They've lost their line of defense and they feel like should something happen, I'm not going to be able to defend myself and these feelings of needing to defend yourself can be real or imagined. So it doesn't mean, you know, you could be thinking, well, there's nothing in this house. It doesn't matter. They know that they can be ambushed at any time and not be able to protect themselves. So that's why declawed cats do tend to engage in these behaviors. So what are we going to do? We're going to do something called the distraction 
and redirection method. And basically what we want to do is distract the cat from when he was about to attack you and redirect the cat to an appropriate means of getting rid of his tension. So I usually say to people, try to get a handle of maybe the triggers or what the situation is that sets the cat off. Is it the time of day? Is it motion? What, if you can determine that, it makes it a little easier. But if you can't, it's okay. The, the, the technique will still work. Basically, what you want to do is when you see the cat get into motion to attack, or if you've determined, I, can, I know the trigger, so this just happened, I know the attack's going to happen any moment, you, would, you want to distract the cat with a toy. It can be a fishing pole type toy, it can be a crinkly mylar ball, something that you know your cat likes. One toy that I highly recommend is the cat dancer toy. They're very inexpensive, they're like two dollars. They're very small so you can curl them up and stash them under a cushion. You can stash them all around your house because and with the distraction and redirection method, the last thing you want to be doing is to have to run down the, to the hallway to locate a toy. So you want something that you can get. So the cat's gotten into motion. You distract the cat with the toy. This now pulls the cat out of that aggressive mode and into the hunter mode. So you're taking the cat out of something negative and aggressive into something hunting and positive. So we shift him out of the aggressive mode into the positive mode, and now we conduct an impromptu interactive play session, as I've discussed before, with captures and mm -hmm. letting the cat play and get the captures. This is a positive way of retraining, because if you just yell no or you squirt with a water bottle, you're not giving him a reason to like the new behavior, but if you can distract him and get him to play, he will then learn that when he doesn't attack, he gets playtime, he gets time with you, he gets treats, and that's all very motivating for a cat. So we're going to distract him away from the, where he was about to attack, get him into an interactive play session, and then play for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, um, multiple captures, little treat after. You remain safe, he's released his tension, everybody wins. Awesome. Okay, so now this the first question, which was Getting remind Alicia me. Getting Alicia in the carrier and being able to pick her up. Yes. Okay. So you're doing the right thing with having the carrier open. Um, so has she gone into it at all yes. on her own? Okay. So if you if you could on the day of the vet appointment not feed her and have food in there, that would be best case scenario is have her kind of wander in to get something to eat. Now what you might want to do before that is, is do that same scenario, put the food in there, let her wander in, close the, close the carrier, and just walk around the house with it for 10 or 15 minutes and then let her out. This teaches her that when she goes into the carrier, it's not going to be all bad, she'll come back home again. And that's a really good way to kind of get her used to that and teach her that She'll go in, but she's going to come back out again. Great. The other thing you could do is um, use um, Feel Away. I am using the, the Excellent. fusers. I also have the room spray, and I'm also using Rescue Remedy with her. Excellent. So I, I think that you'll be okay. I think you're on the right road. Um, if for some reason she um, really freaks out, you can always have your vet give her a slight sedative. And then what happens is she really won't remember the experience and you can keep going with the training. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And how come we haven't trained our cats that way? <laughs> um, because my cats, I can just pick them up, so it's a little easier. All right, exactly. We'll, we'll get rid of that question in post. Um, other questions? Sure. Thank you, Nancy. All right. <laughs> Multi-part questions are our favorite. <laughs> a sneaky cat. Um, <laughs> I have a very shy uh, cat I've been working with for over a year and um, the vet says he has a galloping heart and I said I know because I have to chase him into the bathroom in order to get him to, in a carrier to get to the vet and he says you know no no he really has a galloping heart but I had tried that thing of, of leaving the carrier out trying to get him used to it I even had a big dog crate 
and I put the food in the dog crate, and he went around the back side of it and started poking <laughs> through the fence and was eating out the back side of it. And I just sat there and laughed because you know he, he won't go near a crate if I leave it out for him. But the other thing he does that's kind of interesting is, um, he, you know, he was outside for three to five years, we think. He was an owned cat, so he really had a lot of trust issues. And um, I got, after about six months, I got him so he could be part of the house, and he eventually would kind of hang out with us in the living room, and I, he'll sit on the sofa, and after a few, another month or so, he would let me sit on the sofa next to him, and I can pet him and pet him and pet him, and he rubs his head against me, he purrs, he acts like he really likes it, but the minute I put two hands on him, boom, <laughs> you know. So how do I, how can I get him to that next level where he'll trust me? I've actually been able to pick him up for maybe three seconds and put him right back down. Okay. All you right, know, so I've this is good. i to do that desensitizing, but, yes. but so even getting that far to be able to even get him enough to catch him, to pick him up. So um, for the petting him to try to get the two hands, so the best way anytime you sort of want to um, elongate or, or add to any type of stimulation with a cat, mm -hmm. the best thing to do is go very, very incrementally and always kind of stay um, below that threshold of when the cat freaks out. So we... When you have the two hands on the cat, we want to figure out how long, how long can you have the two hands before the cat actually takes off. Let's say it's five seconds. Let's say it's ten two seconds. Two nanoseconds. Let's say it's two <laughs> seconds. So we want to stay under that threshold. So what you would want to do is maybe literally just touch the cat as quickly as you can and stop. Yeah. And then touch the cat as quickly as you can and stop. And by doing that, you, you always stop before the cat gets to the point where he has the freak out, and then you can very, very conservatively and gradually um, elongate the time your hands are on the cat and the amount of sessions that you do it with the cat. So basically you would desensitize the cat to the feeling of both of your hands. Now, if, 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 the, if the two hands is really, really, really too much for the cat, you could try doing something like this. So some cats are really reluctant to have your hands on them, but they will accept a safe um, distance with the, with the wand. So this is just a, a wooden spoon with a hat on it, but you can even take you know, a, a toy like this and repurpose it. You could do something soft on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, but what you could do is, is have your hand on the cat on one side and maybe be using this on the other. And that could be an interim step okay. to get the cat used to having being touched in two places. So you may find this is much safer for the cat to accept. Many cats who don't like to be petted at all, you can start off with a mm -hmm. petting wand and they will accept it. So try using one hand and try using something like okay. this on the other side. And just get them used to that feeling of being touched in two places and when he accepts that maybe you can gradually even to gr even um, length, um, lessen the length of this with your hand and then eventually get to your hand on there so anything like that where you were very conservative mm -hmm. and incremental and structured will help okay. that's perfect because it leads right to my second question <laughs> because I'm fostering a five-year-old tortie and I know torties have supposedly have tortoise but I never try to believe in stereotypes um, she was a surrender. The owner had to go into a nursing home. Um, so she was alone for a fair bit. Uh, just the daughter was coming in and taking care of her. Uh, I've had her for two months. The lady got her as a kitten. She only just recently started eating if I was in the room. And she, yeah, my, my cat room is kind of cat proof so she, they can run but they can't you know, hide terribly yeah, hard. And he just, she just sort of hangs out underneath my, in the knee hole of my desk. So she's not really hiding. She's just got her spot there. She'll, but um, she only recently, uh, but if I get near her at all, she becomes a slasher. And I mean a serious, I, mean, I have the wounds to prove it. So I would need a five foot pole with that thing. And, and I, some of them and I, I haven't do. been able to even, um, you know, I've been trying to engage her with toys. I'll sit there. And she came with a lot of toys. So I'm figuring at some point she was a playful cat. Right. So I, I'll toss all the balls for her. I'll try to wave things in front of her drag them by. I have this uh, almost a foolproof cat toy that my husband came up with, which is a length of uh, pull chain from a lamp, from a <laughs> pull lamp, because it, it, it makes all this nice snaky noises and it moves neat and makes little metallic noises and they grab at it, but they don't quite catch it. My cats just love that toy, totally ignores it. So try 
this same thing Longer? with a yardstick. <laughs> yes, which I have done before. Oh, okay. There, I have worked with cats when I'm here and may, I don't know, it feels like the cat's in the, in the next zip code. Yeah. But it works. Okay. Um, because you just want the cat to get used to touch and you want the cat to get used to touch with you in proximity, mm -hmm. but you, you clearly <laughs> want to be able to have um, that cat feel, it's a, it's a girl cat. Girl. You want her to have her, her, her own personal boundaries. Okay. So she's just not ready yet to be close, mm -hmm. but you want her to start getting that touch and you want her to get, be like, gee, that feels kind of good and you're there. Right. So that's all positive. So just get, get a yardstick, put something soft, um, she probably will accept that. Mm -hmm. um, with the play, try maybe taking a ribbon or the chain that your mm -hmm. husband made and tie it to your belt <laughs> loop okay. and walk around. Oh, okay. Okay, because that way she's <laughs> chasing you and yeah. she's in charge of the game, oh. which might help. Because okay. sometimes when you toss things to the cat, yeah, it startles them. It startles them, and they're not feeling like in charge of it. Mm -hmm. And with really, really shy cats, mm -hmm. they need to kind of take ownership of the situation and yeah. feel like they have some control. Yeah. So something like that helps. So the cat's chasing you mm -hmm. instead of you throwing something towards the cat. Yeah. So try those two things. But I think if you use a really longer wand or okay. yardstick, that would really, really help. Okay, and just have something that. really super soft yeah. at the end. Now I understand that cats really only talk to people. Is that true? Because, this is true. Okay, because um, she talks to me a lot. I walk in the room oh, and she meows at me constantly, and I meow back to her. I try to talk with her, <laughs> but again, can't get near her. But I did um, actually I felt like I had a small breakthrough the other night because I, I mean, I'll sometimes take naps in that room. I'll read with her. Perfect. I've, I've even done. It's my daughter's old former bedroom, so I'll sleep in there sometimes if my husband's out of town. Um, but the, uh, the other night I was just laying on the bed reading. And the cat actually hopped up onto the bed, started walking towards my feet. I was frozen with fear, and I didn't budge a muscle. And she started kind of sniffing my slippers and started actually rubbing up against my slippers. Well, that's perfect. And I will, off, I will often find that the best thing to do, and I, I think I mentioned this before, you know, when you're working with a shy cat, bring in your laptop, talk on the phone, do your own thing, check your email. Mm -hmm. You want to come off as non-threatening as possible. Right. So when you were just sitting there ignoring the cat, mm -hmm. the cat actually liked it because you weren't threatening to her. Right. And now she can come up on her own schedule and her own pace and investigate you. Yeah. So that's perfect. So just spend time in there. Don't you know directly look at her. Don't make any overtures towards her so you come off as non-threatening and let her control the pace of the interaction. Mm -hmm. And that fits into the thing with I was saying with the ribbon yeah. too. Okay. Let her control the pace of the interaction and I think that you'll find some, some breakthroughs okay. with I'm that. Okay, I'm to be very brave to do that one. <laughs> but I will try it. Thank okay. You. So uh, let's take a commercial break. Uh, Our next question is from Susan. Thank you. Go right Hi. ahead. Hi. Uh, I have a couple of cats that are getting on in age. One's about 13, and the other, I think, is 16. And just recently, they both started late at night talking very loudly, walking around the house, making noise, um, just out of the blue. It doesn't really bother me because I'm usually up late, but it does wake up my husband. <laughs> so, and, and I go and check on them, they're perfectly fine. They're just 
talking really loudly. What can we do about that? Okay, so usually when cats meow, they're meowing to their person. So one cat, Fluffy won't go up to Puffy and say, hey, meow, 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 and then Puffy says to Fluffy, yeah, meow. So usually they're meowing to you. So they want you, they want your attention for something. Okay, so how do we uh, reset that feline alarm clock? What I want you to do is before you go to bed, and not like a half an hour before bed or an hour before bed, but literally five minutes before you jump into bed, I want you to do a very, very robust interactive play session with a fishing pole type toy. So as I described before, you're gonna really rev up your cat, get them going, um, go at it for about 15 minutes, let the cat have many captures, and at the end of the session, now we don't wanna leave them wound up, we wanna wind them down. So again, at the end of the session, gently wind it down, let the prey die, and let the cats have one last big, grand final capture, and follow that with food. So now what you've done is you've gone in that cycle where it's hunt, eat, sleep. So right before bed, you're going to leave them in that very contented, ready to sleep state, and that will help the cat sleep through the night. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, Susan, thank you. So before we get to Janice's question, we were going to hear a story from Michael about how he got the name Bruce Wayne for his cat. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Bruce Wayne? Well, um, it, it, he's eight years old. We got him. Uh, his gotcha day was just last week where we adopted him. <clears throat> so we've had him eight years. So he's Congratulations. About, thank you. He's about eight and a half. We had had another cat, Jimmy, who I had had for about 14 years, and he passed away. So we waited some time before we got another cat. My wife loves cats. If she could have 50 of them, she would. But we can only handle one at a time right now. I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, he's a, but when we got him, he was a rescue, and he was very um, timid, very scared. And uh, his name was Wayne. And he, he, and he was just a little guy. He was the runt of the litter. He was a rescue from uh, Hell's Kitchen in New York, and he went to a no-kill shelter. Uh, they brought him to a foster home, and that's where we found him. So uh, the woman had called him Wayne, and we just didn't feel like it was... Uh, we, he needed some self-confidence. <laughs> so because he had the... You can see he's a, he's a black-and-white um, tuxedo, and he's got the mask like Batman, and we were calling him Batman, but I thought... Why not Bruce Wayne? He's got the tuxedo, he's the millionaire, he can be the Cape Crusader by night. And, uh, and it seemed to work because he started to slowly come out of his shell. He was very much a mama's boy. He you know, really is attracted to female energy and he was really afraid of me. So I had to kind of just like back off and let him come to me. Um, but now he's um, almost an alpha cat. Uh, but he's still, whenever he hears a male's voice, he runs and hides under the bed. Um, so. We're working on him, but um, that's how we got the name Bruce Wayne. Yeah. That's so, a great story. Thank you. What I love, too, is that um, because you were feeling that name would make your cat feel more confident, and you were projecting that, your cat picked up on that energy, and your cat did become more confident. So that's a great story. And he became more like Batman, too. He's very stealth. You know, you'll <laughs> see him in the kitchen, and then you walk into the bedroom, and he's, like, there on the bed. So somehow he, like, gets around very quietly and very stealthy. I love it. He's Thank a fun you. cat. We love him. Thank you. So our two cats were a bonded pair. And speaking about stealth, one of them, like, would freak me out, too. I would not be expecting it, and all of a sudden you turn around and the cat would be there. But the other one <laughs> was the most clumsy cat I'd ever seen or had as a pet. You could hear this cat walking in the other room on the floor, um, so they were at opposite ends of the spectrum between clumsy and stealth. So it leads me to the question, can you talk a little bit about a bonded pair? These two were litter mates, and they were, personalities were completely different. But boy, did they love each other. Yeah, so some cats, some cats are what we call bonded pairs. And people often ask, how do I know if I have a bonded pair? You would know if your cats are bonded if when the other one is not around, the cat behind actually grieves. 
So for example, when you bring the cat to the vet, and maybe the, that cat's not home for a couple hours, or even if the cat needs to be hospitalized, if the one at home stops eating, maybe isn't grooming him or herself the way she should or he should, not using the litter box, these are all signs that your cat is grieving. And if your cat does that when the companion cat is away, then you know that you have a bonded pair. And having a bonded pair can really be an amazing experience because you watch two cats just truly love each other. They'll groom each other. They'll take care of each other. Um, but not every litter mate or every companion cat is a bonded pair. So you really want to look for those signs to see if you do have a bonded pair or not and if they really do need to stay together. Yeah. And we know, unfortunately, we lost one of those cats recently and the other one truly was grieving. Stopped eating, stopped interacting. Yes. You know, it took a while before she started to come into her own. But then her personality really changed. She did. She, she became, became the alpha cat. She did. She did. So the, the bonded pair, one was definitely the alpha and one was the follower. And when um, the more alpha cat died, um, Rosie, who's the one who is um, still with us, thank goodness, um, she really came out of her shell and she blossomed because she didn't have her sister to really light the way anymore. And I think she realized she had to do it on her own. And she did. She, her personality is much more outgoing and she doesn't hide as much. So it, it is kind of fascinating to see how, how cats um, really have their very unique personalities. And I think for people who think that cats are all the same or cats are just so independent, you have to live with the cat and be around cats to really see how truly unique and responsive they are to their surroundings and to their people. And it's actually, I think it's quite beautiful. Really. Has Rosie learned how to read yet? <laughs> Only kidding. Um, so we have another question. Janice, you want to <clears throat> step up and ask Rachel a question? Hi, Dr. Rachel. Hello. I have two cats, and I was wondering how many litter boxes should you have? Is there a, a certain number per cat? Um, and also, is location important? Is it you know where where they're located important? for you know, their well-being? That's a great question. Well, the rule of thumb is you always want one more litter box than you have cats. So in your case, since you have two cats, you want three litter boxes. Um, and now sometimes you may even need more because there are some cats who don't like to poop and pee in the same box. So if you have two cats, you may even need four litter boxes. But if they're using the litter box appropriately, three would probably be fine for two cats. Now, your question of location, you really want to um, spread out where the litter boxes are. Because sometimes cats don't want to have to cross the path of another cat to use the box. And other cats want to feel like they have their own territory when they use the box. So sometimes people will say to me, well, I have three boxes. I don't understand why I still have a problem. And I'll go to their home and see the three boxes lined up in one room. So that really defeats the purpose of having multiple boxes. So you want your boxes in multiple locations throughout the house so your cats have choices, safe places to go, options, and you want to have, let them have that opportunity to really choose and to create their own territory for their own litter box. Great, thank you. I guess I have some work to do. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Susan, <clears throat> can you tell us a little bit about Gus? <clears throat> well, um, well, I was cat sitting for my son while he was away, and uh, I'd go in his house and I'd yell, Gus, Gus, and never knew where he was. And then I look up and he's on top of the air conditioner, like just looking at me, like, what do you want? <laughs> you know? It's but, hot. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So um, he's. He's a good cat. He's just, I, when I go over there, I never know what to expect, you know? But Is the air conditioner high off the ground? Yeah. yeah. I think he just likes to maybe, like, sun himself on top of it, you know, or something like that, you know? Yeah. But Cats like vertical space. Mm -hmm. They like to be up because then they can kind of lord over everything and see right. what's going on and monitor the situation. But, yes, cats also love that patch of sunlight, so he's probably enjoying the best of both worlds. Right. I like the sun too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How are we doing for time? 
because I have a couple more questions I could ask, and unless somebody else has them. <coughs> Okay. Anybody else have a question? Because I have a couple more that I could ask. <coughs> but if what about a cat that just totally utterly disappeared in the house and you can't find it? Oh, we've had that happen quite a bit, yes. actually. Where Rachel's called me freaking out. I can't <laughs> find the cat. So um, you want to talk about their ability to to hide? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sure. Okay. I could rephrase it, but better it come from you. Oh. Welcome back, Nancy. Thank you. <laughs> well, we, we work with um, a cat rescue and, and get a lot of follow-up calls from um, fosters and adopters. And somebody recently a adopted a cat, and it was on one of the shy ones. And we always talk with our, our adopters about the, the importance of doing that very, very slow intro. But somehow this cat has totally evaporated inside the house, and they can't find the cat. It's been several days. What is your advice? <laughs> okay. Well... We don't want the cat to go too long without eating or drinking. So my first um, line of defense would be to entice the cat out with something that most cats find really irresistible, and that would be very stinky tuna fish. Mm -hmm. So if you can put some stinky tuna fish in some spots around the house, the house may not smell too good for a while, but the cat will probably come out to eat, and that's very enticing to a cat. Now. If it's a more serious situation and you don't think the cat is just hiding under a bed or under a sofa somewhere and you think maybe the cat climbed into um, a vent or some, a crevice somewhere in the house, you may want to use special thermal heat seeking mm. equipment and you can do that through the Animal Rescue League or your fire department. Yeah, so depending I think the on Reading Public serious. Library has something like that that you can use for seeing how well insulated your house is. Aha, uh -huh. so something <laughs> like that. The light that. bulb just went off. Yes, I would suggest if, if you think it's a little more serious than just the cat hiding mm -hmm. under a bed or a sofa. Yeah, they've, um, they've, they've torn the house apart. Then I'm, I would suggest using heat-seeking thermal equipment to find that cat. Thank you. So one of the things that I know you're extremely passionate about when it comes to cat welfare is declawing of cats, which I understand is quite inhumane. Can you talk about that for a minute? So declawing, in my personal opinion, is um, torture. I know you hear the word declawing, or most people do, and it sounds relatively innocuous. Oh, we're just taking out the claw. Doesn't sound like it's a huge big deal. But in reality, what they do is they actually chop off the finger at the knuckle and it's quite painful for a cat. Many cats have pain for the rest of their lives from declawing, but what does happen in addition to the physical pain is the emotional distress it causes for a cat. So cats who are declawed now feel very vulnerable they know they can't protect themselves should an opponent appear. Right. So these cats tend to bite more and tend to be a little more aggressive and um, will, will lash out more because they'll kind of overcompensate for knowing that they don't have their claws. So for people who are worried about cats, you know, destroying their furniture or their carpets, as I explained earlier in the show, there are ways to deter and teach and redirect your cats to appropriate places to scratch. So if you have a cat that's scratching, please consult your friendly cat behavior counselor and ask what can be done to prevent cats from clawing and scratching because there are other methods besides declawing a cat. And there is even a product where you can put little soft rubbery things on the claws to keep the cats from clawing and scratching as well. But in all honesty, most cats would rather scratch on a really terrific scratching post than on the furniture anyway. So if you provide these options for your cat and you redirect your cats to the scratching post, you will not have problems with the cat scratching the furniture. Um, our cats use the scratching post just fine. It's not an issue and this is something that can be done with any cat. Dr. Geller, cat doctor, thank you for all this wonderful wisdom that you've imparted on us today. 
And is there any closing words or anything you'd like to leave with this, leave any message that you'd like to leave with this audience today? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. And I'd like people to know that I do offer my cat behavior counseling services at no charge. It's my personal mission that I never want there to be a financial barrier preventing someone from keeping their cat and paying for cat behavior services. So I don't charge and I will do everything possible in my power to help people with cat behavior problems keep their cats in their homes. Thank you all. All right, Dr. Geller. All right.